Anthony Mataris has grown up around shotguns. He was a world junior sporting champion in 2005 and went on to become the open title holder 11 years later. Uniquely, he has also represented the United States at the highest level in Olympic trap. Anthony also has a growing reputation as being one of the sporting clay world's best coaches, which is uniquely refreshing and unusual for someone of his age. His knowledge and his ability to communicate the mechanics of his sport is quite unique. Let's hear from another champion shooter that has turned into a champion coach. Again, from way over on the east coast of the United States, we're getting a lot of people from the United States in this series, another champion shooter that has become a champion coach. Anthony Mataris, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Do you need to be a champion shooter to become a champion coach? It's a great question. Um, it's a tough question to answer. I feel like it, you know, the, the obvious answer is, well, it sure as hell doesn't hurt because you've been there and uh, it doesn't hurt and you've been there. And if the person's asking you a, a question, say that that is coupled with, you know, when I'm under pressure or when I'm in a tough scenario, um, coming into my last few stations, you have a personal experience that you can relate to the person that someone who wasn't the champion could not. That being said, you know, there's a, there's a coach for, for all different levels. There's a coach for people that are taking, you know, sporting as a unique discipline in that if we look at sporting clays, the, you know, there's more money in sporting clays than almost any other discipline than any other discipline in the world in terms of participation and sponsorships and, you know, 1,500 people, 2,000 people at a tournament. And a large portion of those people are, you know, not trying to be the best in the world. They just want to be better, you know. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. And I think the, the question is sometimes unique to the discipline, I guess. And um, so I'm not going to give you a straight answer, but uh, the, the, going back to your question, do you have to be a world champion shooter? No, but it doesn't hurt. Yeah, I mean, you do an awful lot of coaching and I've read a lot of great reviews about your coaching and that's why you're sitting here because you are a champion shooter and you've got a reputation to be a champion coach. But are you ever put in the situation where you're out coaching some double A class shooter, an A class shooter, someone that knows a little bit about what they're doing and you've got an 80 metre crossing tower target that's coming into about no closer than 50 metres are you ever tempted to just grab the gun off the guy and say, this is how you do it? I shoot, I, I shoot very little during a lesson, uh, less than, you know, if I'm out for a full week, a couple times a week while I actually shoot a, a, more than a, a target. But I will shoot a lot holding the person's barrel on, up on their forearm, you know, generally depending on how big they are, either inside their hand or outside their hand. I always put my left hand on their shoulder that way I have a straight line between my left hand and my right hand. And I can shoot almost any target or any pair even by just telling, if they stay relaxed and loose and telling them when to pull the trigger on a bat two at 60 yards or a teal, just about anything, a really fast pair or something like a trap bird out there is tougher. But uh, that's about the only thing that I ever, you know, I do very little shooting, but I do do that often, particularly if someone's struggling to, understand what it looks like you know sporting clays is such a technically challenging sport in that way there's so much to think about and often the target presentation is never the same how do you combat the challenges of exactly what you're saying trying to prepare both yourself and your students for all of the different target presentations that you may get so that's a great question i think that a big misconception in sporting clays is that i've got to learn all of these birds right so eventually you do. Yes, you have to learn all the different shots, okay, et cetera. But the fundamentals aren't that, aren't that complicated, okay? So to get to your target, to directly to your, you know, getting away from just basic fundamentals of stance and gun mount, et cetera, assuming the shooter knows that, um, the bird's got an angle of speed, a distance, and a line. So if you can teach the people how to read the bird, and formulate the plan and the technique. You're gonna have all your different techniques depending on what the shot is. But if you can teach the person the angle, how to truly understand angle, speed, distance, the line of the bird, be able to visualize that. So, you know, if the bird's going to two o'clock or four o'clock, et cetera, pick the right method, okay? 
then lead is relative. So you learn it pretty quickly. Okay. Now, does it take time? Yeah, it takes time. But if you start on closer targets with less distance and less speed and you get a good base and your mechanics are good and your fundamentals are good, you'll learn the shots. You can learn the shots pretty quickly with some practice. The more the person shoots and the more they practice, the quicker it's quicker it's going to come. But really, the only thing that changes is the space in front of the bird to hit the shot. OK, so if a bird is going up or down, you know, it might have a faster speed if it's going down because it's accelerating. But the, the, the game, you can simplify it. So really what I train, teach people to do at all levels. You know, I teach, I just got off the range. I had five. We have a business club in our area in Philadelphia. And I said five fairly novice shooters. And you, I train them from understanding the ideas the same way if you're explaining to some if I was going to take you out and work with you on your sporting because science doesn't change right so you have an angle of speed at distance you have a line so if you can take your fundamentals of uh, good stance good gun mount whatever it is you're doing with that we have various you know from a pre-mounted gun to an unmounted gun to a soft pre-mount really three styles of mounting the gun depending on the target presentation teach them how to pick what to do when Okay, by following, you know, my biggest rule in sporting plays is you kill the bird where you see it the best, period. Okay, really, that's probably any discipline. You kill the bird where you see it the best. Why do you, why did the trap shooter shoot fast? Because the bird's getting further away. Okay, so you, you kill it where it's biggest and clearest. So if that's your first rule, okay, you have a basis. Okay, so now, all right, if I'm going to kill it here, where do I hold? You know, so have basically a rule for that, a rough idea. So you have to have a system, you know? So I feel like a huge part of my success, particularly teaching people over various skill sets, various levels of commitment, different ages from the person I'm teaching who's trying to win a world championship to the person who's trying to go out with his business buddies this afternoon and not embarrass himself when he goes out on Sunday. Um, it doesn't really change. Okay. You know, the game, I try to simplify it as much as possible. Now the complexity of it, like I just, in my new DVD, we've got 39 chapters. Okay. But the fundamentals that you learn in the foundation video, you're doing the exact same thing as you get to the advanced, you're really just finding the best tool for the job. And there is a big component of reading the bird that somebody should help you with. You know, I, I realize that more than I, now as a coach than I than I used to maybe even five years ago is that there's a lot of people that their plan is wrong because they really don't understand what the bird's doing, you know, so that they don't understand what the target's doing or how fast it is or how far it is. So, you know, if I make a wrong assumption that they understand that I'm trying to help them correct something that's really just rooted in not understanding what the bird's doing. So kind of a long answer, but I, the probably as concise as I can get, you got to have a system. You got to start with fundamentals. You got to have, have some rules for how to pick when to do what. You're a little bit unique as a shooter because in 2015, you competed for the United States at the highest level at the world championships in the world Olympic track championship in Italy. The following year, then you won the world sporting championship. And I couldn't think of two events that are further apart than sporting clays where you need to have your wits about you. you need to be watching everything and learning from the people in front of you in the squad or whatever to Olympic track where it's nearly an advantage at times to be brain dead it really is an advantage to think of nothing okay. while you're out there in the middle of an Olympic track competition how did you find the transition to Olympic track when you were seriously trying to um, make every US team because I, I would have thought they were worlds apart Right. So uh, give me kind of a little history of it. I started, I shot my first Olympic trap target in 2013. It was the first time I ever even shot at an Olympic trap target. Yeah. And I did it pretty seriously, you know, and trained. There wasn't, I didn't have a range. We actually finished the range here in 2014. Um, so I didn't have anywhere within three hours. And I would go to the range and shoot maybe every two weeks and shoot probably a thousand, thousand shells. But the difference for me is the game actually in Olympic trap is, is fairly simple. There's not a lot of detail. Um, it's very difficult. Okay. 
because of time. So I came from a discipline. I asked Dan Carlisle. He was one person who encouraged me to shoot Travis. You ought to try it because nobody's shooting well right now. So give it a go. So I said, all right, I'll try it. You know, and I, at the time I did as well as anybody was doing in the U S obviously that wasn't good on a world level, but in, you know, for two years time, I did as well as anybody was doing in the U S the game to me, the hardest part for me is that I never did it. I'm a very analytical person. I can tell you exactly how to, that I shoot every sporting shot. That's why I'm a good coach. Okay. I can say this is what I'm going to do. I'll show you. And then I can step up there and do it subconsciously without thinking about it. Okay. So my mental game is good in sporting, et cetera. I understand the transition from training to your subconscious, et cetera. What happened to me in trap is that for first I started and I said, all right, this is my technique. This is what I want to do. Dan Carl gave me some pointers. Todd Grave gave me some pointers. You know, if you were to ask Todd Graves about talking to me about shooting, you know, I was probably the only person that he's one of the only people that he's talked to about, you know, as a as a coach that, you know, kind of really following, you know, and talking about the small details of what he said. OK, he was kind of intrigued by my breaking down of the game to really understand it. the problem for me in trap was. I never felt like in any of the competitions that I've ever did, I never felt like my subconscious was good enough to step out there and do it because I'm such an analytical person and I could have gotten there, but it, I started at 30 years old and it's for my subconscious to feel like it truly had it where I could step out there and believe that I was going to do it without thinking about it. I didn't have, I hadn't shot enough or I hadn't shot enough and hadn't been in any competition, et cetera. In 2015, same year that I shot at the world championship in Italy, I sh shot at the world cup in Azerbaijan and I skipped the world. We had the world feet test championship in the U S that year. And I skipped it in the month of July. I practiced, and I practiced, you know, three days a week, something like that. Uh, you know, probably 1500 rounds a week minimum. And it was as close as I ever was to being able to trust myself. And I did shoot good there. It wasn't good enough because the range was pretty easy. I shot 122 out of 125. But even then, I was very, I was, I was more conscious, okay, than I would want to be. If I had started the game and just walked out there and said, I'm just going to take whatever I know from sporting and just call pull and let it rip, I probably would have been better in, you know, at it than I would be based upon the way my mind works being very analytical. So do I feel I could still do it? Yeah, but I need a lot of time and I don't, you know, I have a lot of things that I try to do very well and, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have enough time, you know, I, you know, I'm kind of full time at doing about four or five different jobs. And, you know, to be quite frank, you know, I didn't to, I'm, I'm not that, I'm not, a, I wouldn't consider myself a very talented shooter. I'm a, I, I train myself. I understand the game. I got to work hard at it. Even to this day in sporting, I still, you know, I prepare, I practice, I organize myself. I know how to be ready by the time the competition comes. I never quite was able to do that in trap and get to where I could trust myself because the game is a very reactive game. There's not a lot to it. Okay. In one regard, but a small flaw creates a big error because the game's so fast okay you're really not in control of the target like i was my whole life because you still, you're basically beat by every bird and i came from a discipline where you're never beat you're never really beat by the bird unless you intend yourself to be beat by the bird so that's my short answer it's a little bit astounding to me with america having so many amazing shooters and dominating across so many events why is it the international trap shooters just seem to not be, or during that period of time, I should say, they just weren't um, at world standard? To be honest with you, I think it's a, you know, I think it's a major problem that the U.S. faces. And I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's a short term like, wow, you know, we fixed it. Okay, because we have two people, uh, this go, you know, this Olymp coming Olympics. The problem is there's no, there's nowhere to shoot. Okay. It's not an actively participated discipline and compared to, you know, Russell's remark would probably be, well, 
yeah, but in the, the 80s and the 90s, you know, you got, you know, the, the Americans were badass. They were great. But in the 80s and 90s, we weren't shooting sporting clays. Okay. Mm -hmm. So really, we have 10 people shooting sporting clays that are very committed. That's what they do for a living. And they actually make a living in that discipline, you know, maybe more than 10 where they're, you know, you, so I think that, I think that the, there's a lot of kids right now that don't, besides the Olympic dream, unless they really get pushed that direction, there's no comp, there's no trap competitions in the United States. So you take a country that is as big as we are. If you go to every big international trap competition in the United States, you can shoot in three. Okay. In the whole year. Okay. So not, even if you were committed, you don't get any, you don't get any sh shooting in. Okay. There's no practice verse. There's a lot of people that go, there's a lot of kids that go into sporting clays because it's, it's just, it's there, it's available, it's ready. It's an easier discipline to learn when you first start. Okay. I mean, you can't take somebody out on an Olympic trap field and say, Hey, have your first uh, corporate out corporate event here. Okay. You know, so that's where people start. You know, my gun club, we have 1500, you know, we have 1500 new shooters a year come through, maybe more. I mean, brand new, you know, you could never start any of them in Olympic trap. So I think in the U S there's so many avenues for them to do something different that that's where they start. And then we're losing talent. Okay. Meaning that there's no real recruitment for, the the olympic disciplines as much as uh, um there as there could be or there once was you know so in the 90s you weren't going to make a living in sporting plays so if you wanted to do something that was actually you know be in the game you're going to try to go to the olympics go in the army go in the uh Olympic training center. If you get a young person that comes to you um and they have aspirations to say win a world championship sporting event does that actually happen where you get you know young kids yeah. presenting themselves with those sorts of ambitions and goals yeah um, how long do you you know for the olympics when people come to russell and i want training for you know olympic trap or international skate you know if a 12 year old in australia which is when they can first get licensed as us we generally say it's a minimum of an eight-year plan right from start yeah. to finish what is it in in sporting I mean, it's probably the same. I mean, so if you wanted to win a junior world championship or something, for one, you almost have to start before 12 years old, okay? Because we have so many kids starting at 8, 9, 7, 8, 9, 10 in sporting that if you're a 16-year-old kid and you started at 12, you're not going to beat the kid who started at 10, okay, <laughs> if he had the right training, et cetera. So, um if you wanted to be the junior national champion or the junior world champion, which you can start when you're 16, which is very difficult to win at age 16 because you've got 18, 19 and 20 year olds. Um, yeah. It's going to take you at least five or six years to get to that level minimal. You know, I tell people in the U S and there's see what I don't think in trap or an Olympic discipline that, a lot, or any discipline really to, look to be to win a world championship in anything you've got to be pretty committed right yeah you, you know the, a lot of people don't understand that at at any at any discipline you know so i have people that will ask me i'll get my son shooting trap you know maybe he can go to the olympics okay well he's in boarding school outside of new york city okay and he's in high school he's not going to the olympics okay i can't you know he, he doesn't have a range even near him okay he's got to shoot couple of days a week minimal okay you know so the whole idea of commitment is you know for something like that is I think in either discipline is difficult I would say that in your Olympic disciplines it's even more difficult because particularly in the U.S. there's very few opportunities okay you you can learn to you can learn to win in sporting clays because you can go every weekend okay you can go to a tournament with four or five hundred people almost every weekend so you can in trap if you have a bad year well, try your next three competitions next year. We'll see how you do. You know, there's not a lot of opportunities to move your way up. Anthony, I want to ask you some questions that I've asked some of our other champions in this series. Um, 
And I'll give you the heads up. They haven't all given the same answer. I've asked this to Derek Mine. I've asked this to George Digweed, to Richard Folds, and to Danny Carlisle. That's a pretty good selection of sporting shooters for you to be amongst. First question, a hypothetical question. If I was to get you to go to Italy with the 10 best United States VTAS shooters, and George was to front up with the 10 best British VTAS shooters, and you guys were to shoot a head-to-head -head match over 200 targets on a ground set by some neutral people, who'd win the team's event over 200, the US or the British? The US will win hands down. <laughs> Not even, I'd, I'd bet, I'd, I'd bet my, my life savings on it. 20 years ago, if I asked you that question, who would win? Obvious answer. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have a chance. Okay. No. We would lose, we would lose hands down. Just as confident I am that we would win now. I yeah. am more confident that we would have lost 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, Richard agreed. Um, Derek agreed. Danny was being a diplomat and George said the biggest problem they'd have in Britain that seven of the 10 had stab each other in the back before they fired the first target. So <laughs> yeah, tell, me the, tell me the reason why, in your opinion, the United States have accelerated in the world of sporting clays. I think the biggest reason is, you know, so the first thing that people always say is, you know, well, we're, it's more professionalized here. We have more opportunities. There's more people making a living doing it, et cetera, which is definitely true. Okay. It takes a long time and a lot of shells to really master the game, you know, and you have to see a lot of targets, et cetera. So the U S started just way behind, you know, the English, they had a 20 year head start. So my generation, I'm 36 it is the first you know the guys that are under 40 okay is the first generation that ever actually grew up shooting okay so uh richard's what 43 yep. something like that okay so when you had someone who was seven years older than me okay and again coupled it coupled in with say george and all the guys that were in there with them um George started when he was young. He started shooting whatever sporting clays they had at the time, much different than what we had now at a, at a young age. So they are just, they're, they're so much, they were so much more experienced than therefore they're mentally were so much better that we didn't have a chance. So I think really the biggest difference is we finally have competitors that started. We have our first generation of competitors that started as kids. Okay. And I think, I think that's the difference. The next question. Um, you were lucky enough to see IWSF finals at World Cups. Is there a place in the sporting world for a five or six man final at the end of each world championship qualification rounds? Anytime you can put your people on a spotlight that people in this sport look up to and idolize, et cetera, it, it helps the sport. It helps those people. You know, the, if you got somebody looking at you, okay, well, you're, you're more valuable than if you don't have someone looking at you. Yeah. Okay. So the, in that regard, yes, it helps the sport in a growth sense, sponsorship sense, you know, entertainment makes it more entertaining. Um, the, you know, to go into say a zero, you know, starting a shoot off with zero targets, you know, after shooting the world feet test, well, what's, dip, what's so much different about ISSF is you shoot the same target over and over. So when you go into the shoot-off, you're shooting the same target over and over. To decide the championship in FITAS, you have to shoot 200 unique targets, okay? So part of crowning the champion is the person who can strategize and read the clays and understand what technique to use when. If you put it to zero – you're only asking him to do that correctly 25 times. Okay. And you can't cover all the shots or all the techniques that you'd be asking the testing the person on in 25 shots. So yes, from the standpoint of publicity and for the sport and growing the sport and value added, et cetera, from the standpoint of a championship and a competition it's not going to be as good of a test. Could you add it like they do in the world sporting championship? I think that's that's fair to do. So yeah. if you're good enough, go into the shoot off with a 
with a buffer, you know, and then win the shoot off, you know, so. Good answer. Um, for, you, for your info, George said the only reason you guys have to do it in IWSF is your sport's so bloody boring. So you've got to do something <laughs> to make it interesting. I think that, you know, I think that really the, 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 it boils down to, you know, you need 200 targets to test you. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, I do just want to rack your brain while we can. A lot of our viewers are quite technical people um, that like to understand the fundamentals. And one thing yep. that I'd like to ask you about is just in relation to gun setup. Um, first of all, do you use a pattern board uh, for yourself and for your students? Um, what point of aim do you prefer? Or can you just sort of elaborate on, on yep. the ideal gun setup? <laughs> so I... I have my gun set up where, you know, I get in the gun, you know, good cheek pressure. If I get my head down in the gun, you know, speed tests, I'll have sometimes where my gun mount is lighter than sporting because, uh, you know, you make have to make a quick shot from a low gun. But if I'm in a full pre-mount position where I, you know, had time to have the gun mount exactly where I want it, my beads would be, if I had my center bead in, um, a little bit of space between my tiny bit of space between my center bead and my front bead, something I would call 60, 40. Um, I leave my center bead in there. If I get a new gun or I'm practicing, or I feel like I'm not, uh, not a hundred percent doing something right with my mount just to practice my mount. The, for the average person, I would say the same setup, something like 60, 40, have your, you know, your little bit of space between your mid bead and your front bead or see a little, if you don't have a mid bead, a lot of sporting guns now, they're not putting a mid bead, which I think is a mistake. Okay. For a new shooter, I think you got to have an idea of where the hell your eye is in relation to the gun. So now if you get into some eye dominance stuff that gets super tricky. Okay. Eye dominance is, you know, I would consider myself one of the leading experts in the world on it because it's so important in sporting plays and making the right decision is very tricky. So, you know, if you have someone with a little bit of an eye dominance issue and they mount at the shoot at the pattern board, okay, you know, and they're right-handed with a little bit of left eye dominance, you know, I think of eye dominance as a degree, they're going to miss left, okay, on the board. Well, so if they mount their gun, you know, some people are going to adjust that with cast, et cetera. So that's where a center bead gets really tricky. Some people, I, I let them have their eye out of line with the gun. If the dominance is showing consistent of something like that happens. So patterning board can be really scary. Okay. You take a guy that centers the bird all the time, crushing stuff, master level shooter. And he goes out there and shoots at the board and he goes, Oh, I'm shooting to the left. Yeah. You're shooting to the left because you're a lot, got a little bit of left eye in your shot all the time. But during the, during the shot, your brain actually compensates for it and, or, you don't mount the gun dead center under your right eye. So now you don't have an eye dominance issue when you're shooting, but you go shoot at the patterning board and you, you think you got a big problem with your guns. I never shot an over and under until 2013, the year that I started to shoot trap. I shot a semi-auto for 18 years. So when I decided I'm going to shoot some traps, well, I'm I was like, I should get an over and under. So <clears throat> beginning of 2012, I got a new barrel on my uh, 391. Didn't think any of it. I didn't practice a ton in the beginning of the year. Went to some shoots, shot poor, didn't do well at the beginning of the season. Started, started, uh, you know, practicing through the season. Got to practice, you know, get not shooting very well. I went in the U.S. Open in 2012 with this new barrel. I shot my other barrel out that I had on my 391 before. I used the same barrel for like 13 years. I blew the choke out of it, just through the, the threads wouldn't hold anymore. But anyway, so I got the new barrel at the beginning of the year. 2013 winter of 2012 I go getting a stock built for a DT11 we set the gun up exactly I've never patterned a gun on a pattern board in my life okay set the gun just if I can hit the bird see the sight picture they want hit the stuff hard gun feels good doesn't kick get the pitch right um, we set my DT11 up to look exactly like my uh, 391 in terms of looking down the barrel we we go out we're shooting it i'm crushing stuff with the uh with the dt11 shooting it jim greenwood my stock maker we shoot right at his place do it all like in two days and go home with it basically just minus putting the finish on i said you know what, jim while we're here why don't we 
I have my 391 with me. It looks exactly the same. Why don't we shoot it at the board and shoot the DT11 at the board just to see what, you know, see, make sure we got it 100%. We shoot the 391 at the board, which I've now been shooting for a year. The pattern is like 60 to 65% low. Okay. And I'm like, maybe I jerked the trigger. Try it again. Same thing. Jim says, let me shoot it. Okay. He, so then he like, he actually bench rest shoots it. The barrel was bent or the choke was thread was cut wrong. I shot a gun that I started at the beginning of the year struggling. I practiced my ass off through the spring, won the U.S. Open, okay, with a barrel that shot 65% low. And so what that tells you is how, how much your brain learns, you know, your hand eye learns what you're doing, you know, so the pattern in board at that point, if I would have shot the gun on the board, I guess would have told me something if I shot it at the beginning of the year, but on the flip side, okay. Maybe the, all the practice that I did trying to figure out why I couldn't hit anything. Okay. Is the, got me trusting my hands and my eyes. And I won the U S open because I was the gun shot in a different spot. And, but my hands and my eyes and my brain figured it out, you know, <laughs> so kind of a unique story. <laughs> yeah, that is very unique. Did you give up on the pattern board or did you end up shooting the DT 11 on it? <laughs> so we shot the DT 11 on it. It shot 60% high, just like it looked. And we, you know, I've still got the barrel, you know, at my house. So the old barrel. <laughs> Anthony, for an elite sporting shooter, how much of your training needs to be actually practicing targets as opposed to actually getting out there and getting competition. Is there any place for elite shooters just to go and practice? Really for a long time for me, uh, I really haven't been shooting enough competition. So really for like the last 10 years, actually, I actually plan to shoot more competition this year than I had in a long time until COVID. But I did, I still have shot more this year than I have with COVID in competition than I had historically. So it's, you need both. Okay. So I got a long, I got away for a long time shooting like 2,500 registered targets a year, which we can do 800 in one big tournament. U.S. Open and Nationals is 800 each, you know, if you shoot the 12, only the 12-gauge events. So I got away for a long time uh, from the time really I graduated college in 2007. I shot quite a bit, 2008, eight nine, and then I just been working hard really for about the last 10 years. And I would shoot all the big shoots, U.S. Open, Nationals, World Championship, go to almost none of the regional championships that we have. And I got away with it along for a long time through train right before a big match for, you know, if I'm home for four or five weeks, try to shoot thousand rounds a week for thousand rounds a week for four or five weeks before I do that three times a year. There's my 15, 18,000 practice shots a year, all right. Six weeks before a big shoot, go to the three or four big shoots a year. And I got away with it for a long time for a couple of reasons. Number one, I had shot a lot as a kid. Uh, I used to shoot five, 5,000 registered targets a year. Back then, that was a lot. Now, some of our best competitors in the U.S. are shooting 8,000 registered competition targets, 12 gauge only. You know, that's a lot of shooting. Yeah. So really what happened in the last couple of years for me is I, I could practice you know, I have my own range. If I say I'm going to practice for four or five weeks before and I set my mind to it, I can set up anything that I want to shoot. That wasn't the problem. OK, it was it, the problem was I wasn't in enough. I wasn't in enough competitions to when you step up to the line in a competition, the, the truth comes out. OK, so you you really find out what you know or you don't know. So I didn't put myself in enough competitions to actually know what targets made me nervous okay therefore my practice really couldn't be specific enough to fill fill my voids in my confidence so at the end of the day the practice in sporting matters only about confidence so if you're shooting a lot of competition and all the birds that you come up against you're confident in and you're rolling and you're doing good and you're on the right side of the confidence curve you don't need that much practice. Okay. So I've shot a championship in August, two championships in August. I just shot one last week in Vegas. I shot a local competition two weeks ago in Maryland. I feel as confident in my shooting right now as I have in a long, long time. 
Okay. So I don't really, I got three or four shots that I want to practice. I'm going to practice some of the staple shots that I know they're going to ask us to hit a bunch of times. So you need both, you know, to truly do it. But if you're shooting a lot of competition, you can get away with, you can get away with less practice. Okay. So it's, I would say the answer to your question is you need competition. You do need practice, but at the end of the day, it's confidence. If I feel like I can hit every shot, I don't have to go practice because I know when I step out there, if you don't have any doubt, if you, if you've done it for as long as I have, or some other elite shooters, if you don't have any doubt in any bird, then there's nothing to practice. But if you have doubt, you got to get your ass out there on the practice field or you're going to miss. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting answer because we spoke to Derek mine, who's obviously going to next year's Tokyo Olympic games. Yep. I hit him up with the problem that he faces in the United States for so little Olympic trap competition. And with COVID, he can't travel overseas. So I asked Eric what he's planning on doing to train for the Olympics. So he said, I've got about three or four sporting matches this month. And then I'm going to the World American Ski Championships. And then he's I see shot in the ATA Grand American and whatever. But I'll put you on the spot here. And it's a question that I did want to ask you, but I, um, I know that you won't see this coming. In 2019, I think it was at Churchill's, you were involved in a little bit of controversy, weren't you? You shot a stand where the machine had clearly changed, um, but you were yep. put on trial by social media. And I read a lot of the comments and a lot of people defended you. Can you explain what happened that day, Anthony? Yeah, so what happened was I shot a layout on, uh, let me fix this real quick. I shot a layout. On my first parkour, I actually shot with a guy who, um, Bastian Harvet. I can't, I'm not sure the exact pronouncing of his name. I believe he's from France. Okay. Um, he's a very good shooter. He was on my squad. Okay. And on our first layout of the day, we started at 8 30 in the morning. We were one of the first squads, like third squad to shoot the targets. So we get to the final peg. There is a bat to target um that is 100 unhittable okay it's not hittable with a shotgun okay <laughs> we had to shoot at it two times either they put the targets in you know bat two you can put in right side up right or upside down they my guess is they put it in right side up and it should have been upside down the trap could have moved i guess but anyway long story short you've got a shot at it when it was 90 yards at an edge bat two so Obviously, nobody on our squad hit it. Bastion actually missed it on the single and the double and then missed the only – on that pad, he missed the only four birds that he missed on that last peg, okay? So there's actually an effect on his other targets because he shot at a target that's unhittable probably. He might not have missed the other two. But anyway, long story short, we didn't think anything of it. We just thought it was a bad target, and uh, we went on our way. You know, the referee was apologizing before we even shot. That's how unhittable the bird was. I'm having lunch. One of my fellow uh, teammates is there, Brad Kidd. He's in the, uh, the shooting village where we're having, you know, or the vendors are set up with lunch. And I'm like, what layouts do you shoot? He's like, I shot on, uh, I can't remember the layout was. They, they name them by manufacturers. You know, let's, let's say I shot on Beretta. I think it was Beretta. He goes, I shot on the Beretta layout. I'm like, what about that, that bullshit bat too? He goes, what are you talking about? He shot about two hours after me. I'm like, the peg four, the bat two. What, what about it? I'm like, it's not hittable. He goes, no, nah, everybody on my squad hit it. Okay. I go, everybody on your squad hit it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, then they changed the target. Okay. Or you're not referring to the same layout. I'm like, give me your paperwork. You shot this layout. Yep. He goes, yeah, everybody at least hit it once. Okay. I'm like, well, the bird's different then. So I talked to, I talked to someone else. Okay. They shot in the F later in the afternoon after him, they said, well, it was definitely hittable. I wouldn't say it was easy. Okay. So the next morning I went up there. Okay. I got on the bus. You got to take a shuttle there. I rode up there and the bird was, uh, totally different than I shot. It was showing belly so they flipped it either up the other direction and you know people were hitting so i filed a i filed a protest essentially what ended up happening was from all the information i got the bird got moved three times okay they screwed up it got moved way in 
okay, or flipped it, and then everybody started hitting it, all of them. They realized now it's that much different, so they pushed it back out by, by the afternoon on the first day. My friend Brad was lucky to shoot it, uh, I believe it was Brad, when it was the easiest, okay? But anyway, long story short, so I filed a protest. Uh, as I'm trying to file the protest, they told me it's, it's not protestable. You mean it's not protestable, okay? The threat, you threw a totally different target to some of the competitors, okay? It's not protestable. It's the referee's fault. The referee needed to call it a no target. I'm like, well, the referee has actually already told me that because I talked to some, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I know some, some of these referees have been doing it for a long time. Uh, that the target setters, that they've changed the bird, okay? <laughs> you know, drastically. So anyway, long story short, they – they ruled that my protest was it was because the referee screwed up and didn't call it a no bird that you can't you can't protest basically the flight of a target without the referee's call of a no bird or the referee basically making a stink of it themselves. So a long story short, they just to, to eliminate themselves a potential problem, they didn't worry about the fairness of the competition. My squad mate, Bastian Harvet, who's a great shooter, uh, he he came in fourth place, and he lost a shoot off between uh, Richard Falls and Derek Mine by one play, and that would have been a shoot off for him for the silver and the bronze. And in that discipline, to get a silver medal. For him, you know, he's not George Digweed of uh, Fetas, okay? He's an up-and-coming, you know, world-level competitor. To get a silver medal changes his year, okay? Changes his life, potentially, in terms of a sponsorship, et cetera. So, so I have a problem with that, you know? That's, you know, and that that's basically, you know, the story from start to finish. They Fetas actually called my governing body and told me that I needed to take down my – uh, Facebook post, so they're going to ban me. Okay, and I, well, you should feel proud. They're looking at your Facebook page. They wouldn't look at everything. And I, uh, I, I called back our the the director of our organization. I said, call him back and tell him to ban me. Okay, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what he did. He called him back and said he's not he's not going to take it down if you feel necessary to ban him. He said, by all means, do. Well, it's good to hear they didn't ban you. That that question leads to the final question and it's a difficult one but you will be the best person to run this by and this relates to the very first time you and I ever communicated together um, and uh, hear me out because it's a bit of a long-winded question okay. um, towards the end of the last decade uh, there was no doubt double trap and IWSF discipline was on the way out the IWSF were experimenting with looking at bringing in some type of sporting clay event. They went as far to have a trial event at a World Cup in Lanato, and I think Richard Folds was asked to shoot in that event. This is at 2009, 2010. Double Trap continued to decline. They took women out of the event, and then they just made it so technically hard that there were no new shooters coming in to the sport, and they were going to lose it, absolutely. And... I thought there was a perfect opportunity to adventure further down the path of bringing in some type of compact sporting layout. They had the right idea. They just set the targets wrongly at this event in Lanato. Do you think if I gave you a piece of paper and a pen, you could design nine different sporting programs over a compact sporting layout that would fit inside an existing skeet field? and come up with eight machines, with eight machines, that would be the criteria, to come up with nine different programs to make it an interesting and television-friendly sporting event that could be used at Olympic level. Would you have the capabilities yeah. to do that? Yeah, I mean, it's just geometry. So if you just you, you just get your geometry and figure out your angle speeds and your distances and you know create a parameter for distance, you, the hardest part was you'd have to throw to make it universal where you could throw it across the world, you'd have to throw most of the birds on edge. 
Well, okay, that's so. your point where you saw that, obviously, you've been on the downside of an, an incident over in England where you clearly had a target that was wrong. Targets in IWSF have to be standardised. So if you're coming up with nine different... Yeah, yeah, so, you know, if you think of a skeet and a trap bird, there's no tilt. You know, it's basically, except for adjusting for windage, as long as you did that in sporting, you, you know, you could create a menu that is it could go as far as to have the notches on the machines like they have in trap. And you could, you set a distance, you put a marker, the bird lands there. It's got an angle. It's got a, you know, you start off of your, say you put three or four shooting positions or five positions, like a compact, whatever you want to do, use five positions, like a, like a trap field. And you just basically have an angle, you know, set it with a distance like you do in trap or skeet yeah. and um, have an angle and an elevation and you could, you could do it very, very simply. The next part of that question then, and um, it was hounded down by a few people within the sport. A few people in the clay target and the clay target machine industry were very vocal against it because they said no real serious sporting shooter would cross over and shoot that event. But I would think there are over a million sporting shooters in the world that would love the opportunity to go to the Olympic Games in a similar discipline than what they're currently shooting. Would that be a fair assessment? Absolutely. I mean, there's, 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 there's more people shooting sporting, I would say, than, Anything. than any other discipline. Okay. By, by a large margin. So if you think about it, the – Whoever is in charge of the organization, ISSF, I guess, it's a, it's basically like, you know, it's basically like saying that, hey, our customer uh, consumes X and there's X, there's more people consuming that product than anything else and we're not going to sell it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it doesn't make any sense not to have it because you would have instantly, okay, if ISSF wanted to make a lot of money, okay, and you wanted to create followers and sponsorships for their organization, et cetera, have sporting, because that's what the rest of the world shoots. We have millions of, we have, they estimate millions of people shoot sporting recreationally in the, in the United States. So you would now have followers, okay? You literally, ISSF literally doesn't get 250 diehard followers from the whole United States that actually know really what's going on. You know, what's good. There's, there's millions of sporting clay shooters that don't know who Vincent Hancock and Kim Rohde are two of the best shotgun shooters to ever shoot a shotgun because that's not what we do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not what the people do. So I think ISSF has a, actually from a business standpoint, you know, you're basically, you're not selling the most consumed product in the world. Yeah, I'd love to own the rights to that event. And I think the IWSF missed the boat. They ended up introducing trapped mixed teams, trap mixed teams, which is as boring as batshit. And right. uh, they didn't get any new competitors out of it. And I think they missed the boat. Anthony, we've gone way over time and I've got through about 10% of the questions that I really would like to ask you. But um, thanks for your time this evening. Uh, you've got a wealth of knowledge and at some other stage, I'd love to do the second part of this interview. Yeah, let's do it. I'll do it anytime you want. We could do the next series of five all on you, I think. Anthony, it's been <laughs> fantastic to catch up with you tonight. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with our viewers. And we look forward to watching you, how you compete. First of all, at the World FITAS. Whoever wins it, I agree, <laughs> will call them the world champion. And we certainly hope it's you. Very good. good Thank you. It was fun. And uh, thanks for everything you guys do. I like your stuff. Um, you know, I'm a student of shooting i study the game i'm you know i'm a as as nerdy as they come when it gets to you know details of shooting etc i listen to all your stuff and listen to all the you know every podcast that anyone does about shooting because i'm you know sometimes i listen to something and learn you know learn one thing or learn how to say something so thanks for what you guys are doing for the shooting community thanks Thank you. look forward to catching up again cheers